So you've decided you want to start a business in the earthworks industry, then this is the show for you. G'day and welcome to another episode of Earthworks Hub, where we talk everything Earthworks down under and everything international as well, I suppose. I'm your host, Ivan Olvik. Welcome to the show. I want to say a big thank you to everyone that's listened to the first episode. I'm actually really overwhelmed by the amount of people that have given me encouragement and given me some feedback. Um, I really didn't know how big this was going to get. So I think it's actually gaining a bit of traction. I've got people that are already willing to be guests on the show. I've got other companies asking to be sponsors. Um, I've got some really good feedback from people on, on adjusting the studio. So I made a couple of changes here. And uh, yeah, look, it's the first thing, first time I've done a podcast like this. It's a learning curve. Um, I've just got to roll with it and hopefully it will improve as I go. Uh, it's very encouraging and inspiring to get this sort of feedback. I'm going to take on board a lot of things that people have told me. Um, I did get some constructive feedback about being a little bit stiff. Uh, people were telling me I should have probably been a bit looser, you know, relax, chill out a bit. Um, so I'm going to be taking on a bit of a different approach. Nah, just kidding. I promise I will loosen up a little bit. Um, just give me a bit of time. All right, so I'm going to give you a bit of an update of what's been happening since the last episode. I've been obviously working on this second one, scripting it, trying to get things together for it. Um, I've been working on the website that's still under construction. Can't wait for that to come out. It's going to be a very, very handy tool for all of us in the industry. Uh, like I said, podcasting is not as easy as I thought. I've been fighting with my computer, uploading this, downloading that, trying to find out what equipment I need, trying to organize all, all the different audio, visual. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been a very, 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 very busy week. A big thank you to our sponsor for this episode, Melbourne Tractors. They are a leading Cabelco, ASV and New Holland dealer. Um, so if you're ever looking for a new excavator or a skid steer, go down to see these guys. They offer both sales and servicing. So today's episode is all about starting a business in the earthworks industry. Uh, it's going to be focusing on also purchasing equipment and what type of equipment you need. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about eight key steps um, which stem from my experiences. Uh, before I begin though, I just want to make a quick disclaimer. I'm not a professional business advisor. I'm going to be basing all my uh, points on experiences I've had and things that I've encountered during the process. If you are really considering starting a business, uh, also go and see some uh, legal advice or see your accountant um, before you make any sort of uh, decisions. One main piece of advice I would give to anyone starting a business before I get to the eight points is to allow for a lot of days without work during the year. Um, you know, when, you, when you're trying to figure out what sort of money you're going to make, don't count on working five days a week you know, uh, for 52 weeks of the year because there's going to be a lot of times where you're not working and you're not going to be making money on those days. So the whole point is basically make sure you've got a buffer account and you have some cash set aside for those days. For instance, when it rains, you obviously can't work in the earthworks field. We're dealing with dirt and stuff, so it's going to be muddy. And that also means you're not only not working on that day, but you may not work for a few days after that until it dries up. So that could be three, four days already that you haven't worked. Then you've got, you know, when you get sick. Then you've got when you go away on holidays with your family and stuff. Then you've got RDOs or rusted days off. Um, you might be injured. Or, or There's a whole bunch of stuff that um, you need to take into account. And when you add it up, they're actually it actually does work out to a lot of days um, that you're not going to be working. 
So yeah, make sure make sure you allow for these quiet times. And just remember, the main thing is, if your equipment's not working, you're not making money. And the whole point of starting a business is to make money. Um, and another point on that is, if you've got full-time employees, um, more than likely you're gonna have to pay them. So just remember, if you're not making money on that day, you still gotta pay them. So uh, make sure you've got that uh, money available. So, eight points. The first one, what type of work are you going to actually be doing? And make sure it's something that you're interested in, not just something that you think, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money on this. Because the novelty will eventually wear off and you're going to start hating it. And before you know it, you'll be um, you know, finishing up on it, finishing up the business. So make sure it's something that you like, something that you're interested in. But what I mean also is that you need to know what type of earthworks you're going to be doing. Are you going to be doing landscaping? Are you going to be... Uh, an excavator owner operator or a skid steer owner operator are you going to buy a tipper and drive tip trucks um, from sites you know carrying materials are you going to be an asphalter or work in road building um, you know are you going to work on on big civil sites um, are you going to be piling drilling um, you know all those sort of earthworks things are you going to be an ndd uh, truck owner so make sure that's something that does interest you and that's something that you can see that you can be in for long term. And it doesn't mean if you start in one thing, you can't do something else. I mean, I started just with an excavator, working on large civil sites, but then later on, I moved into doing some landscaping or site cuts, bought, bought some smaller equipment. So you can, you can chop and change. But at the start, you might be stuck with that machine for a while before you can afford to get something else. So just make sure that you can, you can um, enjoy what you're doing, you know what I mean? Number two, Plant and equipment. So once you've decided on what type of work you're going to be doing, then you can actually decide on what machine you need. So if you're going to be doing landscaping, obviously you'll need something smaller. If you're doing work in backyards, you're going to need like a 1.7 ton excavator. Um, you might need a trailer to carry it on. You might need um, a little skid steer or a little tip truck. So you're going to need smaller equipment. If you're going to work on civil sites, obviously you might be uh, getting some bigger equipment. So that's when you might be looking at getting a grader or a bulldozer or, you know, like a large excavator. And then you might be doing like drainage or, or road cutting out roads and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, once you know the type of work that you want to do, then you can also work out what equipment you need. And then it even goes for if you're going to get like an NDD truck. Are you going to get a 2,000 litre tank uh, truck or are you going to get a 10,000 litre one? Are you going to do like smaller jobs like, you know... Um, emptying out little Telstra pits and things, or, or are you going to work on, on bigger things and, and jetting and, bla and blasting and doing other things? So they're all the considerations. If you are getting some equipment, then you need to also work out what attachments you're going to have. So if you're getting you know, a bobcat, you might need a, a smudge bar or leveling bar, or you might need like a, a Harley rake or something. If you're going to get a excavator, in Melbourne, we've got a lot of rocky areas, so you're obviously going to need a rock breaker, you're going to need a sorting bucket, a ripper. So these are all things that you're going to have to buy as extras on top of your equipment. Um, some people also opt to get GPS. Nowadays, it's becoming more com common, you know, machine control, GPS on your machines. So you have to work out whether you're going to put those on. And then even if I'm talking about trucks, you know, uh, quarries don't let you take material away without tarps. So a simple thing, a simple thing like tarps, um, you know, uh, height limiters, scales and weight scales on your, your trucks, all sorts of things. You got to look at what uh, specific attachments you're going to need for that equipment. So once you've determined what equipment you need, then you got to work out how you're going to move that. So if it's a truck, obviously you can you know drive it around. But if it's like an excavator or something that um, is, is a bit larger you need to work out are you going to buy your own truck or can you put it on a trailer if it's a 1.8 or something you put it on the trailer if you've got a 5 or 6 ton excavator or a posi track you're going to need a truck to move it around and if you're not going to be able to buy your own truck then you're going to have to use a low loader or heavy haulage company or a tilt tray to come and pick it up and move it so then you've got to um, allow for those costs for every time you want to move the machine Where are you going to store that equipment or plant or truck? Um, most councils in Australia won't even allow you to park heavy vehicles in a suburban street. 
So um, you might be getting away with it. So I know a lot of us park them there. I took over my whole street. I'll put some photos up, have a look at these. When I first started, I had um, tray trucks, tip trucks, posi tracks, excavators. Um, oh, you, I can't even remember what it was, but I took over the whole street and I was fortunate enough to do that for a number of years before I think the, the neighbours finally had enough. Um, and then the council came knocking on the door, so I had to go and look for some storage. But um, yeah, I used to... I used to get phone calls at six in the in the evening after dinner saying, "Look, you know, we don't need your five tonner tomorrow. We actually need your posi track." So I'll be there at um, you know nine or ten o'clock at night. Ramps coming off the truck, you know, reverse beepers going, taking machines off this truck, moving them onto another one. So uh, I'm actually thankful that my neighbours put up with it for so long. So thank you to those neighbours. Um, so yeah, make, make sure you figure out where you're going to park that because that's another cost. If you've got a tip truck and you can't park it at home, you're going to have to find somewhere for truck parking and then they're going to charge you for that too. So that's another cost you got to uh, consider. If you're going to be leaving your machines on site, so especially if you've got large, large machinery that stays on site or even if you've got small machines, I nowadays still leave my little uh, five tunnels and posies on, on site. Um, make sure you've got some form of protection. So how are you going to protect these things? One is vandal covers. I think it's very important to have vandal covers. Two, have uh, padlocks on your on your fuel um, caps. And three, you need tracking devices on everything. I can tell you from experience, I've had a posi track stolen. I've had a little 1.7 tonner on a trailer stolen. I've had my 20 ton excavator uh, broken into numerous times. Even with vandal covers, I mean... They just use a grinder and, and cut through the locks. Um, I've had batteries taken from machines. I've had diesel siphoned. Um, on the 20 tonner, they took uh, a hammer once and a ripper. And uh, oh, look, I can't even remember. I had a five ton hammer, five ton rock breaker taken uh, in another place. Um, there, I've had on one of my five tonners, I had it sitting in a basement somewhere, and some kids decided to, to do target practice on it. Um, obviously I didn't have vandal covers so when I got, got there in the morning every window was broken every panel was dented they even freaking shoved uh, rocks in the exhaust so um, yeah make sure if you are leaving it on site at least make it a bit harder put some vandal covers on put a, um, a padlock on the fuel fuel cap I know a lot of guys say they'd rather they don't even some guys say they don't even lock the fuel cap because they think it's better to just let them take the fuel if they want it rather than damage you and have to pay but if we all just did that, they're just going to keep coming back. So at least deter them a bit, make it a bit harder. And I have been on sites where other machines have been siphoned because they didn't have padlocks and mine were okay because they did. So, you know, if you can make it a bit harder, just do it. When you've got your equipment, if you can't do a lot of stuff yourself, like servicing that, then you've got to decide on who's going to service that. So you've got to keep your maintenance up because a lot of companies are asking for you know maintenance um, schedules. When you buy something new, most of the time the dealerships will be able to help you out. Even if you buy something secondhand, for instance, if you buy a Cabalco, I'm sure Melbourne Tractors or someone like that can still service it for you. Um, so most dealerships will have mechanics on site and mobile um, that can do your servicing. But may, I think if you've got larger machines, and even for my smaller machines now, I just get the mechanics to come out on site and make sure you get to know a mobile mechanic and develop a good relationship with them because these guys are the ones that are going to help you. When your machine's down, like I said earlier, you're not making money. So the quicker you can get that thing back up and running, the quicker you can start making money again. So it's vital that you have a good relationship with a mechanic, someone that you can call because most of the time it's going to be something urgent or it's going to be after hours and if you're one of, the, one of their customers that's a pain in the ass and you don't pay them on time and you complain about things they're not going to come to you you'll be you'll be at the bottom of the list so have a good relationship so that when you do call them they'll go oh yeah Ivan's a good payer yeah I'll go I'll go and do his job first so it, it makes a difference do you buy or do you hire it's been a, a bit of an ongoing um, argument Actually, I might just have this beer. Yeah, do you buy or do you hire? Um, 
I don't know. Which one do you guys think? I personally purchased my machine um, because I knew what I wanted. I had some experience in it. I knew I was going to work on civil sites and I bought the 20 tonner straight up. But um, if you're not sure, if you're a little bit unsure or you don't have funds or you've got bad credit or something, you might have to go and hire. So hiring might be a good option in that case. Or, or um, And look, the thing is with hire, you can always just give the key back and, and you know, uh, get, get get rid of the machine um, but if you buy it then I suppose you're stuck with it so if you, if you don't like it you know it's going to be a lot harder to sell it and get rid of it um, some people think that if you rent it that money that you're paying for rent you could have already just been paying off your machine so you know what I'll leave it open um, it's a bit debatable actually you know what it'd be good to see what people say give me some feedback on that if you can't get uh, funds, if you've got um, issues with that, some of the ways you can get uh, machinery, I suppose, something I should have mentioned earlier, is that you can go and find like a finance broker that specializes in equipment. Uh, sometimes if you buy brand new from a dealer, it might be a bit easier to get funds because they've got in-house uh, brokers and obviously they're going to try and push a bit harder to, to get you the funds. If you have to, you might have to do a bit of a redraw on your home loan or something or try and get like a, a personal or a business loan through banks, or ask family, you know, depending on the, on the amount, you're not going to go asking for 200 grand, but if you, um, you know, have something that's a reasonable price and you think you can pay it back, speak to your family. You might, you might be able to say, work out a way to pay them back. A hot tip for you, if you're currently working and you're on payroll or, or full-time or something, try and buy the equipment before you become self-employed because once you're self-employed, Banks will require at least two years of financials before they even consider giving you money. So try and do it um, while you're still working somewhere so you've got pay slips and that to show because that will definitely help you. I must talk the microphone out then. Experience and training. What experience have you got? Are you experienced enough to, to do that work that you're, that you're intending to start? Um, you know, what qualifications do you need? Does it have to be something formal? Can you go do a day course? Do you need a certain ticket? Do you need, you know, like a, an excavator ticket or a loader um, ticket or, or a roller ticket or something? So make sure you find out what you need before you do it. You don't want to be driving a tip truck with an MR license, but you're meant to have a HR license. So just... Double check all that before you start and make sure you get all, all the right accreditations. As a basic um, a basic bit of uh, education you need, I suppose, or a ticket you need, is the construction induction card. We call them a white card or a red card. That is basically required on every site. So make sure you've at least got that to start with because you won't even be able to get on most sites without that. Also, when I talk about experience, make sure that you're actually experienced in using that bit of equipment and that you know what you're doing because um, you don't want to just go out there with no experience. You'll get noticed. Customers are going to know straight away this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Um, I took a bit of a punt. I didn't know everything, I suppose, at the start and I came off fresh out of a corporate job so I only had the experience that I gained from weekend work and stuff like that. So when it came to doing a bit more detail work, I did get signed off a few times. So don't, don't get... Um, disgruntled by the first hurdle I had times where I got signed off uh, jobs you know big um, civil sites because I was too slow in loading trucks or my final trim wasn't the best um, and look I came home a few times and said that's it what the hell have I done I'm giving this shit up I'm going, I'm going to go back to doing what I was but you can't give up don't give up just keep going and if you're not sure go and get some training pay someone pay someone to train you Go and do it. Do, go and do some extra extra courses. You can still use YouTube. A lot of people laugh about it, but you can actually find a lot of stuff on YouTube and TikTok nowadays. Guys are posting um, phenomenal material on how to do just the basics, even. Um, or go work for free for someone, or better yet, try and get a job. Make sure that you've at least worked in that field or worked on that equipment. So work for someone to start with, and then go and get your equipment. But yeah, make sure make sure you've got the right qualifications and, and tickets. So after all that, point number four, create or, I suppose, create or get your business name. So 
before you go ahead and start getting all these all these logos designed and everything, make sure that that name's not taken. Go onto the ASIC website, which is ASIC. Um, I'll post that up here for you now. Go on that website, type in the name, do a, do a registry search, and if it's free, it'll tell you. If it's not, try a different variation. Um, so sometimes you might be able to take out a space, or you might have to add like a number or letter, or just change the whole word, I suppose. But yeah, go to ASIC, make sure that that name's not taken. The next thing is to decide on, are you going to be a sole trader or a company? Um, speak to your accountant because you, you, you might have different ways that you need to set it up, but you, your accountant can definitely help you um, sort that out. Once you've chosen that name, make sure you register it, get yourself an Australian business number, ABN. Um, the accountant can once again help you with that. And then you can go and start creating your logos. So if you want, you can find some apps where you can get free logos. You can go see a graphic designer. Um, for Eagle One, I just made a lot of that stuff up myself using using some of the software. But for like Earthworks Hub, I've gone out and got a proper graphic designer. And um, yeah, you can use that on your merch. You can use it on your machines and your cars. A lot of sites prefer you to have your, your equipment stickered. So, so they can tell who you are. You can use on you can use the logos on your uniforms, um, and then that way you, you can start your branding. Number five, insurance. What insurances do you need? So there's a there's a couple of insurances or a number of them that you actually have to have regardless, and then there's a couple that are optional. Public liability is the first one. All customers will require that you have at least $10 million to cover. Uh, some are even asking for $20 million nowadays. So make sure you get public liability. Work cover insurance, that's to make sure that you're covered in case you get injured at work or if you've got workers, any of your workers as well. So make sure you get that. You can also set that up through your, your accountant. That's what I did. Motor or plant insurance. So obviously, insuring your equipment. Make sure that your equipment is um, fully insured for damage, theft. Um, what I will add to that, a hot tip, another hot tip for you, with Positracks and Bobcats, just double check if there's a clause in there. Something I discovered with my old insurance company was that they had a clause that if the machine was stolen within so many Ks, so many kilometers of the CBD, and I didn't have an immobilizer, um, I wouldn't be covered. So, Make sure you you check if there's a clause for that in there because if you don't if your machine goes missing and you don't have an immobilizer on there or proof of you know that you did have one, you might not get covered. So look, that's the last thing you want. So just check for these clauses. Um, then you will also want income protection. So this one is I suppose optional, but I would strongly suggest it. Imagine you get hurt. So yeah, imagine you get hurt. You know, you've gone to the gym, you've ripped a muscle, you know, showing off your muscles to the boys, or you come off your dirt bike when you've gone away on the weekend and you can't work. Like I said earlier, your, your machine's not working, you're not making money, where's it going to come from? Income protection will help you with that. Um, check, obviously, what it does and doesn't cover. So make sure it actually does cover you if you come off your dirt bike or whatever. But um, I would strongly suggest that. And the last one, not insurance, but sort of related, superannuation. Um, some of the guys I know in the industry say, ah, I don't need that. You know, I don't want to uh, worry about super now. I need the money. I don't want to worry about super later. I need the money now. Um, yeah, look, you know what? I can probably agree with that in some way. But you've got tax benefits if you do pay yourself super. And you're giving yourself... Uh, future protection, or you know, you're putting money aside. Look at it that way. Don't look at it as in, you know, I need the money now. Put some money away, and um, you know, I don't know. I don't, it's up to you guys. Actually, another thing that you can probably give me some feedback on: Why wouldn't you bother putting super in? Number six, bookkeeping. How are you going to handle all your records? So I started. I started off with. So you got two options: one to do it basic and manual, or two is to use some software. So I started off the basic way, just got myself a, a tax invoice book and, you know, it has carbon copies in there. And then I used to just put everything into a spreadsheet for my accountant and send it all off to him. Um, then I used like Microsoft Word or Excel to do my um, quotes. 
but then I moved into Xero. Uh, basically, Xero is a piece of software where it does all your accounting. If you've got an accountant that also hand, that uses that sort of software, it makes it a lot easier because they can remotely access that and you don't have to like send them stuff. They can just log in themselves, see what they need, take, you know, take whatever information they want. And you can um, reconcile all your receipts on there. You can um, do some, in, you know, do all your invoicing on there. And then the best thing is, if you've got employees, why do I always say employees? If you've got employees, it'll come in a lot handier than doing it manually because the old way, I used to have to go into the ATO website, work out how much tax I've got to pay them. Then I had to go and work out how much super. I had to go and like put in a, um, make, make a pay slip on, on Excel. Whereas now with zero, I just put in whatever money they've made for the week and it works out everything for me, sends them a pay slip and I don't have to worry about it. So you, know, you don't have to use zero. You've got my ob, there's a number of other ones, but um, definitely the software made my life a lot easier. And yeah, I don't have to frequently visit and send stuff to the accountant. He just looks at it all online himself. And um, yeah, it's all good. Number seven, how are you going to find work? You know, are you going to advertise? Are you going to try and just use word of mouth? Different options, yeah? When I first started out, I uh, started with plant hires. Plant hire agencies, um, probably a good idea when you are starting out because they can um, find work for you. They'll obviously take a bit of a commission, so you get you know a bit of a lower hourly rate, but they find the work for you. And you don't have to go searching for customers, go searching for um, getting, you know, chasing them for money, and all that stuff. These guys will find it for you. They'll ring you up. Can you come and do this job tomorrow? Are you available? And yes or no. And just and that's it. It's it's pretty easy. And they pay. And they always pay. Um, at the start, you can't be too fussy. If you're going to work for an agency, obviously you're going to start at the bottom of the list. Yeah, they'll have a whole bunch of guys that are already on there. They'll they'll be getting priority. So you, at the start, I was getting all the shit jobs. I was working you know two hours away from home. Um, you know, always getting getting um, last minute calls and then last minute cancellations. So look, at the start, yes, it is a little bit crap, but as you prove yourself and they see that you're keen and you're always and you're always turning up to work and that, they'll start feeding you more work. You'll work your way up the priority list and they'll, they will. And look, I've developed some good relationships with, with plant hire companies because they come in handy. Now, if, I need, if I'm doing a project and I need a, a tip truck or if I need um, a certain bit of equipment or if I need to find a tip site where I'm gonna dump the material, I just call the agency and they, they organize someone for me. They organize a tip site and, and it makes life easier. So yeah, not only when you start working for them, don't, don't think about the immediate, um, what's happening immediately and complaining about, oh, you know, they're sending me all, to all the crap places. Work out, work, work your way up the list and then eventually you'll develop that relationship so that when you do get bigger and you go out and you do your own quoting and get your own jobs, you can still use them. You'll still be able to use them. And then when you've got quiet days and you haven't got work, you can always call up and say, hey, I've got a few days spare. What have you got? So yeah, keep a good relationship with them. Um, what I would also suggest is putting in a Google page, a Google business page. So set up one of those. They're easy to do. And when people type in, you know, looking for, you know, a truck or, or looking for a, an excavator, your name will come up if you, especially if you're in the, in the same area. I think it goes by by closest um, closest business. So yeah, just uh, put that in. It works. I, I used it for a while, and it does actually work. You can print yourself some business cards. Um, I use something like Vista, where they, it's a cheap alternative. They print off you know 500 cards for a small amount, and then you can use that to to hand out to people, um, put them in letter boxes, turn up to sites, hand them out to to um, supervisors and that's another thing so the other the other thing you can do and i used to do this a lot is you just drive onto a site if you if you're looking for work in the civil industry drive into the site ask for the supervisor you know introduce yourself explain who you are what, what you can what machinery you've got and you never know you might get work out of it i got work out of it like that so do that do or highly recommend it and not just um civil sites you know, building sites, whatever, wherever you can see the opportunity to work, go in there, introduce yourself, and um, you never know, you might score some work out of it. Websites, um, I didn't have a website at the beginning, I always thought that, you know, why do you need a website, but 
as I'm seeing more and more, the first thing I do when I'm trying to find out something about a company is I go to their website. So if you haven't got one and someone types in the search and they're looking for you, they're going to think, you know, one, this guy's a bit dodgy or, you know, he doesn't care. So I don't know, but I recommend getting a website. You can get a free one-page website from someone like GoDaddy and it's easy. I, I made one myself and I'm not a, a professional web designer, but I made it myself and it looks good. Social media, it's big. Um, get yourself an Instagram account. Get yourself a Facebook account. Join some Facebook groups. There's plenty of Earth Moving and Earthworks groups where the guys are advertising that they're looking for machines or looking for equipment. Um, you've got certain uh, groups for, for trucks, certain groups for excavators, and certain groups for graders and whatever. So yeah, join those groups and you can win some work out of that. Um, get put some um, Gumtree ads up, you know, put some um, TikTok videos up of yourself doing stuff and say that you're available. You never know, you might win some work out of it. Um, I personally don't think of one like an actual job out of something like Instagram and that, but what it does do is it keeps you in people's minds. So there's been times where I've posted things and then I've had old customers ring me up and go, hey, how are you? Um, I saw you post the other day. Um, I've got some work actually, you reminded me it reminded me that you've got this such and such machine. Come, come and do a job for us. So you can you can um, win out of it. And sometimes, if you know some people in the industry, just ask them if they've got excess work. You know, if you see someone with a similar bit of equipment, say to them, "Look, if you get any excess work, just you know, throw it my way." And that's how we end up helping each other. Number eight. So these are just a couple of additional um, things that I want to add. So. Three basic things that you're going to need is a risk assessment. So usually you have to have an annual risk assessment done on your equipment or your truck. Um, there's guys that come out and do that for you. It doesn't take very long. And what they'll be doing is just checking to see that the machine's in, in good condition. There's nothing that's um, a risk to someone getting injured. Um, they'll be looking for safety features, you know, your, your um, flashing lights, stop, emergency stop buttons, reverse beepers extinguishers and stuff like that and nowadays a lot of um, companies are asking to see the paperwork for that so make sure that if you get a risk assessment they put a sticker on there for you to say it's done and that um, they give you the actual report so you can hand it to the customers um, you need to get yourself a daily pre-start book that's just to make sure that you can show someone that you've done an inspection on your machine before you started working some guys think they're a waste of time and they just do a tick and flick. But I can tell you what, I've had instances where WorkSafe turned up on site and they've asked me to see my book. It's the first thing they say, show me your, show me your pre-start book, show me all your um, documents, your maintenance and your tickets. So get yourself a, a daily pre-start book. If you don't want to get it in a book format, nowadays they've got apps that do it. So um, it's, there's probably no excuse to say I haven't got a, um, a pre-start book. And the last thing on that on that is high vis clothing. When you work on any site, they're going to ask you for at least they're going to say you need high vis um, top and pants. Nowadays they're saying no more shorts on site, no more short sleeves. So you'll need long sleeves, uh, long sleeve high high vis, um, long pants. You'll need le leather lace up uh, steel cap boots. Um, and just a hot tip for you. I've actually started using plastic cap instead of uh, steel because in winter your toes don't freeze. So um, I think the steel makes your toes a lot colder. So I use plastic ones now. Um, so yeah, you need your steel cap boots or plas plastic cap. Um, now, and they're also saying you need safety glasses. Can't be wearing your Carreras like I do. Yeah, they, they want specific glasses. Um, gloves, hard hat and some ear protection if you've got something with a lot of noise so there's some of the these are some of the basic points that i experienced when i was starting my business and something that i think can help you start yours there might be some things that i've missed um, like i said i'm not a business advisor i'm just giving you um, information from what i've experienced so i've explained about all the admin and you know and how to buy equipment and you know um, how to start the business so that's all that that part there is as much as advice as i can give you all the rest after that is up to you how you perform at work is going to determine whether the customer calls you back or not 
So now it's about building up your reputation. You know, make sure you turn up on time. Make sure that you're reliable. Make sure that when you're at work, you're always doing something. You're always moving. You're always asking, is there something else you want me to do? Use a bit of initiative. Don't just sit around. Um, don't just be one of those guys that sits in there and goes, oh, that's not my job. I'm just here to operate. Or, you know, um, on the phone all the time. The worst thing you can do is be on the phone all the time. You don't want to be there, you know, working for some plumbers, have a 500 kilo um, concrete pit dangling off your off your um, excavator arm, ready to put into the ground, and then you're on your phone talking to someone about something. You've got to give your full dedication to that customer for that day and take your phone calls during break times or after work. If you really need to take a phone call, at least just tell them, um, I'm just going to be offline for a minute. Um, you know, I'll just give me five minutes and wait for a time where they don't need you for a second. You know what I mean? So that that's one of the things that um, I would definitely say there's nothing worse that when I'm running a project and I walk around and I see people on their phones, it makes me sick. Um, especially when you see laborers standing around or spotters that are meant to be spotting someone digging something and they're on their phone. A big big no no. Make your make your work neat. Make everything you do neat and tidy so that everyone knows you as the, the guy that always cleans up after himself. And and the same thing goes with your machinery. Make sure you've got clean machinery. Don't leave it so it looks like dog shit and they, they come and they look at his machine and go, What the hell is that? You know, you wanna you wanna come there presentable. Nice, clean machinery, maintained, and know that it's going to be reliable. You don't want to get there and the bloody machine doesn't want to start. Or you've got a, you've got, um, a truck with a flat tire and you're just like, ah, don't worry, we'll fix it at the, end of, at the end of the day and keep operating like that all day. You've got to come there fully prepared to work with clean, clean uh, machines ready to go. Just remember, it's never too late to start and don't give up when you hit the first hurdles. There's going to be times where you, th you think twice and you start questioning whether you want to continue, but just don't give up. And talk talk to other guys in the industry. As you get to know people, don't be afraid to call them. I call my um, mates from the industry often and we have our little therapy sessions and we talk about issues and problems and then that makes you, makes you um, feel a bit better because you know you're not the only one um, going through those issues. You know what I mean? So make sure you develop some contacts in the, in the field and you call each other every now and then. So, um, yeah, don't don't give up after the first hurdle. So I've provided you with as much information as I can. Now it's all up to you. You make the next move. I wish you good luck, and feel free to contact me if you've got any questions. Speak to your accountant. Speak to other guys in the industry. Uh, you'll you'll find that more more often than not, guys will be willing to help you. I'll have links to a lot of resources that you can use, like all the ones I've spoken about. They'll be all in that um, website, earthworkshub.com.au. Like I said, it's still under construction, but when it does come out, you'll be able to, to access all those links. And then to finish, I was watching a, a YouTube video recently, and the guy was saying, this is a guy that um, talks about creating podcasts, and he was saying that you know, you need to know what your mission is, what, what's your podcast about. And it made me question myself, well, what's this podcast about? One, it's a tough industry. Um, I'm still in it myself, so I understand it fully. And I want to make our lives a whole lot easier. Two, uh, this podcast will show everyone what other, other people are going through. So when I'm interviewing guests, we'll be learning from their experiences. We'll be able to take that back and apply it to our businesses. And we'll be able to... Um, you know, assimilate ourselves and, and see see that we're not the only ones going through this. Like we're all in the same boat. So, and that's and that's what it is. I want to build a bit of a community somewhere where we can all talk about things and learn. So that's that. I've also got some personal missions. So one is I find that when I'm operating, and the last couple of years I've been I downsized and sort of uh, have been in the machines a lot more. I realise that from personally, I've lost my ability to communicate a bit because. You're sitting in the machine all day, you're quiet. Sometimes you're in a posi track for eight hours a day and you're not really talking to many people. So I feel like I've lost that little ability to sort of talk and use use my words. So through this podcast, I'm hoping I can learn to do that, to build on my communication skills again and that. So 
not only am I going to try and help the earthworks industry, I'm going to try and develop myself. So, um, yeah, so bear with me if sometimes you can see me struggling. I want to try and say something and I can't say it. It's just me uh, redeveloping my communication skills. I hope you found today's episode inspiring. Thank you again to everyone that listened to the last podcast and thank you for your feedback. Keep doing that. Keep giving me feedback. Um, it's only going to help me and inspire me to do more. Um, next episode, hopefully I'll have some guests on the, on the next couple. And yeah, don't forget to subscribe so that you know when the next episodes come out. And I'll put a whole bunch of links down in the description. Thank you for listening. See you next time.